Well, hello and welcome to our latest Mobility podcast. This one we're calling Legal After Lockdown because we're going to be looking ahead to 2021. And after the stinker that has been 2020, we want to hear about what IT leaders in the legal sector have got planned. We're going to be talking offices, people, innovation, well-being, culture, tech, and whatever else my guests today have on their minds. Which brings me to the panel we've assembled today. So let's meet them. Bruna Palici is Chief Technology Officer of global law firm Linklaters. Hi, Bruna. Hi, Martin. Lovely Thanks for inviting me along. Next, we have Abby Ewan, Technology and Operations Director at National Law Firm Brown Jacobson, which operates across private and public sectors. Hi, Abby. Hi, Martin. And we have Karen Jacks, Chief Technology Officer of International Law Firm Burden Bird, which focuses, it says here, on helping organizations being changed by technology in the digital world, which is a lot of us, I guess. Hi, Karen. Hi, Martin. And last but not least, we've got Shane Taylor. You know Shane. If you follow Mobility, he's the founder and CEO of the company. Hi, Shane. Hi, Martin. Great. Well, we're all assembled here. We do have to look back a little bit before we look forward. I suppose 2020, a bit of an Anis Haribalis, I suppose. But looking back over the year, maybe one of you wants to shout out what worked and what didn't when it came to tackling this COVID-led disruption. Do any of you want to start us off? Yeah, Karen. So I think I'd speak for all of us, but I'm sure um, Abby and Bruna will correct me if I get this wrong. I think as a whole, the legal industry reacted really well and quickly because we all managed to pretty much move our entire workforce to work remotely, bearing in mind that right or wrong law firms sometimes got a reputation of not being quite as technology focused as other industries. But I know that pretty much all of my peer group got everybody working from home very effectively. And as with said earlier, we've all been super busy on client work right still here to the very end of the year. So I think all of our peer groups did really well in this and it has been a bit relentless. And it's actually, I think, getting harder now when you've got, you're in the office, you're not in the office, you're back, then you're not back. <laughs> it's getting quite challenging for everyone, not necessarily from the technology front, more from the probably the mental health front now. Go on, Bruna, please. No, I agree. I think it's been an extraordinary year, actually. People juggling the social distancing, the lockdown, the homeschooling, the the whole thing. So all that stress and and extra stuff that people are dealing with has kind of really tested, I think, our resolve as teams all all across the firm. I think what's happened, though, is actually we've really seen people rise to the challenge. I mean, it's opened our eyes to new ways about thinking about things, new ways of working and actually embracing change. Whereas before, it was hard to sometimes get the change that was needed or to get the engagement. If we can say some good things have come out of this, is actually I think people have stepped back and realised there are other ways of doing things. There are better ways of doing things. From pioneering new technology, like kind of the first virtual trials, to actually just the way the teams are coming together, helping each other more across the various areas, from technology to, to HR to legal operations. Some way this has brought people together, I think. And it helps us explore the art of the possible. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It has been, as, as Karen said, a little bit a bit like the hokey cokey recently, hasn't it? You know, which tier are we in and what can we do, what we're allowed to do? But I do think, generally speaking, the CIOs throughout this, that people have felt they'd be really happy with the way they've been able to deploy remote working, home working, and uh, keep the wheels turning. Abby, what about you? Are you going to concur or disagree? I'm definitely going to concur and it's taken the IT department to a whole new level of recognition of exactly what the value is. If anyone was in any doubt, the value that we add to organisations, whether that's a law firm or any other kind of firm. The thing that I found the most interesting, so to echo Karen's point about people having risen to the occasion and really lots of circumstances where it's brought out the very best in people. We've been on a trajectory for the last few years of changing management and leadership styles anyway, I think. And this has accelerated not only the technology transformation, but it's also embedded in people an acknowledgement of how important well-being is, about how important it is to talk about mental health, about how important it is to be an inclusive, supportive employer who focuses on people and not necessarily on profit. And that's come through loud and clear across every area, I think, of the whole country and probably the whole world, where there's definitely been a focus on Yes, we make sure that everyone can work at home, but we also make sure all the time that they're all okay. 
and that yeah. you're making sure that you're including the people who aren't showing up to the social events because they might be the ones that are struggling. You can't necessarily see that where you would be able to clock that much more in an office if you were close to people. And certainly we've noticed at the beginning, my direct report saying to me, meetings last much longer now because people want to talk more. So that whole pastoral care thing has been so much more crucial, I think. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think definitely we'll come on to talking about culture and mental health and well-being a little bit more later. But Shane, you've had a ringside seat on the other side of the fence. You've been surprised, delighted by what you've seen and what you've heard back from the front line? It's been quite interesting, actually, at the beginning in April that there was an instant stopping to a lot of projects that weren't deemed key and critical as everything focused towards you know, supporting the firms from home. We've done this legal in lockdown now, legal after lockdown since April through the summer and, and now the last one at Christmas. But it seems that it's gone from, oh my God, panic, what we actually planned for. I think a couple of months ago, things really started getting going again. And now what we're seeing is the huge amount of projects planned for 2021. And I think we've got what was the, the projects that didn't get done in 2020, plus all the plans that were already in place for 2021. So I, I think it's probably going to be a very busy time kind of catching up, I guess. At the same time, I think, as everyone's mentioned, what this has done is force the use of some really, really good technology. But as human beings, it's sometimes difficult to change our behaviour. So I've heard a lot that firms are saying that, you know, especially with collaboration tools, all that kind of stuff, that people are realising the power of a lot of these tools. It's actually got accelerated the adoption of some of these tools, which, which is a, a massive positive. Well, we're using one of them now, aren't we? I mean, Zoom has just been amazing, hasn't it? What happened to them? I interviewed the CEO not long before all this happened, and now he's one of the richest blokes in the world. Let me ask you one quick one, which is, you know, there is this theory out there that digital transformation or transformation generally really stepped up and accelerated it uh, during the year. I wondered, I must admit, when I, when I saw that, where some of the figures from the analyst, whether they were being a little bit optimistic about what had happened. Uh, but what's your feeling? Do you feel that you actually stepped up the rate of change that you were possibly already going through at the time? Karen, please. To quote Microsoft CEO, who I wouldn't normally be, be quoting, but I'm doing a presentation on Monday all about this. He, he's saying there's been two years of digital transformation in two months. And I think that is exactly it. Just take MS Teams. So at the beginning of the year, we were all doing our Office 365, or we were, and people didn't really ask for it. It literally went from overnight to all our clients and contacts all adopting teams literally overnight, and therefore we have to do the same. And that posed some challenges <laughs> to us because if you hadn't got to the point of having sort of the foundation of that in, and you've got 3,000 or however many users to push out a new piece of technology to whilst you're all working remotely on remote technology tools, we were almost like we, we're in danger that all our clients are going to be ahead of us on this. So I think this has forced change. It's forced people to have to use products. You know, our usage of video has gone up by over a thousand percent. And now everyone can only do video. We seem to have lost the ability just to do a phone call now. It's got to be a video call. But that has been, we kind of did the remote working bit. And then we had to look at what projects we were doing. And it's literally turned all these projects upside down. Because before you're rolling out a new product, you'd have training, you'd have floor walking, you'd have someone flying over to another one of our offices to do whatever they need to do. And we couldn't do that. All of a sudden, we couldn't do it. And we held stuff for a bit. And then you're like, we can't hold. We've got to continue because we will just fall behind everything. So then we went from holding to accelerating projects and just accepting that we've just got to do a completely different model than we've ever done before. And it has worked. If you'd have asked me this, oh, could you do this project all remotely? I'd have gone, absolutely not. But we have, because we had to. We've opened a data center in one of our German offices completely remotely. We moved an office in Hong Kong completely with no, you know, no one flying anywhere because we couldn't. And we've rolled out a whole new platform. So... It's challenged all, all of us, but we've had to transform because else we're just going to be two years behind all our competitors. Yeah, and Abby, you have a similar experience? I, I do, and I think it's quite interesting that we are always quite 
quick to assume that the lawyers don't want to change the way they do things and can't foresee of a different way of doing it. But actually, IT functions can be guilty of the same thing. So to mm. Karen's point, she would have said, no, you can't do it like that. And actually didn't have any choice but to do it all remotely because that was the only way that you could. And we haven't actually stopped doing anything. We have been 100% busy throughout. We haven't put any projects on hold. We accelerated the rollout of Teams to echo what, what Karen did, but we haven't actually, nothing got delayed. We did a Windows 10 Office 365 rollout remotely, which was logistically interesting. And lots of courier companies got lots of cash out of that, which I'm sure they were very grateful. And in fact, even more so, we have invested in technologies that we know are going to help us now and in the future. So from that perspective, that's the positive part of the experience. I do wonder how much of it continues into uh, 2021 when hopefully at some point we get something like a return to, to life before 2020. Is your feeling on the panel that all of this persists or, or do we have a correction and we go back to some of the, the older policies? Anyone want to pick that one up? Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, because as part of coming back, everybody I think is now reviewing how they're going to come back. And that gives us something else to have to think about. The whole way we've furnished, staffed, and the technology we've got in offices is very likely going to need a rethink as part of people coming back. There's a lot of discussion in, and lots of people doing lots of announcements about more of a flexible working pattern. I've heard every combination of what that might look like that law firms are talking about. I don't think we will ever get back to where we were completely. I think there will now we have proven that you can work remotely. You can roles that you have never thought. I was always, I always need a support team in the office. Absolutely got to have that. And now I'm like, no, I don't. Actually, I've just proven I don't need to. But we need to rethink of how we use technology in the office. I said about now every call has got to be a video call. Okay, well, we need to think about how we use our breakout rooms, for example, because they were very much more that you could move on an audio call. Now you, you want to pick up. So it's so... I think 2021 is going to be as busy and I'd like to think exciting as, as we've just had in the, to echo Abby's point, everybody now has a bit more of an appetite for change and to try different things and try different ways of working. And we need to capitalise on that and get a bit more brave, I think, a bit more bold. Oh, that sounds good. What about you, Bruna? Yeah, I think the challenge would be how can we keep up with the pace? Because we've now shown actually everything that can be delivered much, much more quickly is actually how do we find that the, the right balance of, sort of not doing things the old way, but actually finding a happy medium. I think there'll be challenges as well, whereby in a mixed world we'll have, it's almost easier if everyone's all in the office or all at home. But when you have some people at home and some people in the office and you're not quite sure where people are going to be on, on, each, on each day, I think, you know, it'll lead to new technologies and, and different ways of thinking to make sure that people are planning their day better. So typically, if you've got a day full of meetings, maybe you, you're staying at home. But if you've got a day where you want to catch up with people, then you come into the office and the office becomes more of a collaboration space. So I think there'll be a, a period of time where people are finding this new mixed way of working until it till it settles down again into a, into a new normality. I don't think it'll settle down again, at least for, for a year or so. I, I think the challenge we will have is how do we keep people motivated, make sure people are, from a mental health point of view, in a good space and keep people connected because I, I do think as much as I I used to hate working from home couldn't stand it. actually I quite I don't mind it now it's quite good but after about three or four days of solid videos it can be all quite consuming and really tiring so how do we make sure people are getting the right mix and the right adjustments so, so there is some space in the day to, to take a breather and actually you know so you're not burnt out by the end of the week yeah I think those are excellent points and, and as I say I think we'll come on to culture and and mental health and so on quite a lot through through this uh, session. But Shane, did you want to come in? Again, our, our last debate, a, a huge amount was around staff welfare development. And, and I just think back to kind of when mobility starts in cloud and mobile and talking to law firms, and it was an aspiration. And, and we talked about if you give them the right tools and you make them more flexible, then you're going to attract better staff, retain key staff. And I think it all boiled down to commercials. At the end of the day, it takes great investment to move the needle on your IT strategy. But this, this has done that. And now we're starting to hear about work-life balance. We get the right homeworking versus office policy. This could be the difference between keeping or a 
attracting the next key new talent. So it's definitely changed, moved on its head there. I was just going to say that, picking up on Karen's point, when everyone was last in the office together, they were working very, very differently on that infrastructure. They were forced to work from home. Everyone just about was given a laptop they didn't have before. And of course, everyone started using video. Now, when that all comes back into the office, it's difficult to know what that's going to look like. That's the difficulty. We started talking about the new norm, but what, what is the new norm? There's not one approach. So do we downsize on offices? Do we increase offices? Do we stop leases? I mean, if we let people work three days a week, are they all going to want to come in on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday? <laughs> we don't know. And I guess that's the challenge for you guys is what, what are we actually planning for at the moment? Because I have responsibility for operations as well, which is facilities, building management, print, post, courier, all the bits that were actually quite a lot harder. The technology bit was very easy for me. Everyone just picked up their laptop and their headphones and went home. A thousand people just left the building. The operational part of that has been significantly more challenging, particularly around making offices COVID secure for when people did start to come back. And then obviously we've had this sort of rather hokey cokey, as we've said, movement around offices. But if you just look at the commerciality, so I'm in a situation where I'm saving a lot of money in one part of my team. So when I look at my travel costs, which I imagine pale into insignificance against Bruna's travel costs, which have reduced by a factor of of a thousand percent. So printing, posting, courier, confidential waste, shredding, even the milk in the Nottingham office, which I discovered cost me thousands of pounds a year. All of that cost, organisations will slip back into certain ways of working previously, but they won't go all the way back because the commerciality of that doesn't stack up. But actually what it does do is it, it frees up some of the money that you were spending on traveling to invest in technology instead, which is what we've been doing. So you're actually repurposing your investment to accommodate and encourage and progress these new ways of working. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think what was interesting over the course of the year, and we're still learning now, is some of the assumptions we had were completely wrong. People said, well, young people, they'll love working from home. Old people will love to come into offices and they'll hate it. And in a lot of ways, it's been completely the opposite is what I've heard. Uh, Things like onboarding are quite difficult to do remotely. So if we end up in this sort of hybrid future, what are you thinking in 2021? Are you thinking about office redesigns? Are you thinking about shutting down some offices and changing the look and feel of others? Any of you, please? Karen, please. So, yeah, I mean, this is under a lot of discussion at the moment because obviously we're an international firm and there will be different requirements and different desires in each country as to how they want to work going forward. But there is a general acknowledgement that A, there's an opportunity here, if not in the short term, definitely in the long term around what you could, even if it's not, it's not necessarily less premises, it's just different use of premises, I think. But that's quite long term, but some long term leasing and so on to take into that. I think I think it's essentially this kind of hybrid model that it's not particularly where you're working, it's how you're working. So you could say over a two week period that you expect people in, say, 50 percent, how they do that, they can have the choice. But actually, I think they can only have the choice so far or else you will end up. It will be Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and Monday and Friday. The office will be empty or you will choose days that you never then get to see your team. And as part of this, I think there has to be a bit more of a structure in you need to plan so that you can get teams together. How are we going to use meeting rooms? We've got stacks of meeting rooms that are (laughs) empty, closed up. My feeling is that they will never go back to being fully utilised. But we need to think about how you're changing the technology in there, particularly when you've got now half the people at home, half the people in the room, which to me is a worse experience than having hybrid, I find awful because the people in the room talk to the room and you're the ones feeling remote. So we need to think about how we can manage that, either technology or behaviour or combination of. But there's a definite shift with us to this is the opportunity to rethink some of this. And to also all of our clients, you know, we've got a lot of big tech clients Some of them have already stated they will not ever be going back to where they were before. They've already stated it won't be for some time or possibly never. 
And I think we need to react to that as a provider to them that we're working in this new way, whatever that is. Not defined, is it? It's not defined, but we need to be thinking about it. Definitely a change change of mind there. What about uh, you, Abby? I do think that's an important point that has never been more important to listen to our clients and ask them what their expectations are. So the desire to create an environment that is the way it used to be because we need to service our clients and we've been used to servicing them in a very particular way, it's really important to not make any assumptions about what they're going to want going forward. And that's not just related to the tech clients. I was talking to the chief executive of a multi-academy trust a couple of weeks ago, one of our clients, who said that they had signed a contract on the preceding Friday. And he said that had we been working under normal circumstances, there's no way we would have got it done as quickly as we did. Because the virtual world creates a velocity around it because you're not saying, well, we need to get everyone together in a room and we can't make that week. So let's push it out to the week after or even the week after that. People are much more accessible. And he said, I don't want my legal advisors to go back to an environment where they expect everyone to rock up into a a big room and have a big meeting like that. So I think it's really crucial that we understand some clients might want that. Some clients might never want to see you face to face ever again. And I think it's really important that we understand that before we make the assumptions about rekitting out all our meeting rooms to accommodate client meetings, which might not be happening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bruna, from your point of view, you mentioned mental health as well, of course. And I think we've all had to be very aware that even if productivity has increased in many cases is what we've heard, that might come at a cost that you risk burnout or people's mental health being affected adversely at Linklater's or personally, what are, what are your positions on how you strike that balance? Yeah, I mean, from a mental health point, Linklater has been great running lots of different initiatives to making sure that people are aware and understanding how to deal with the the topic, how to have sometimes those challenging conversations and actually really keeping a close eye on how people are working if they need some time out. And I think that's the only thing that can be done. It's a constant monitoring as to being closer to the teams, making sure you've got strong comms in place, regular comms, so so people are aware of what's happening in their teams plus what's happening in the wider firm and how what's happening outside in the world, especially at the minute with all the uncertainty that's going on, might impact what, what they're doing. I think it's really important that we make our teams feel safe and actually supported. If I could just add to that, I think going back to Karen's point at the beginning of the session where she said IT functions in law firms stepped up and blew away the myths that we are not tech savvy organisations. I think equally, law firms have in the main shown themselves to be very good organisations at dealing with well-being. I speak to friends who work in different kinds of vertical markets and organisations, and actually the support that they've had is, is nowhere near what law firms have provided in the main for their staff. I'm sure there's a, you know, an exception to, to that here and there, but I think that Certainly from what I've observed from all the people that I speak to in all the various disparate law firms, I think they really stepped up and made sure that they were supporting people across the board. Yeah. And I think that's ranging from, you know, providing kit at home to to support in the way of people to talk to if you need some help, making sure that people are aware that it's okay to be flexible if you've got to do a school run or you've got the kids at home, making sure that people are really comfortable that it's accepted that we will be working in a different way. And we need to get stuff done and there's patience and tolerance. And I think later it's just been absolutely great for that. Yeah. Did you find any practical things that worked or didn't work initially? We were all plagued by Zoom quiz invitations, weren't we? And were there ways that worked in handling all of this? Anyone have some good experiences or things that they tried and decided, no, that one tanked? We had several hundred people doing yoga class every morning on zoom with a Mm. with a yoga instructor i wasn't one of them but i understand they were very good we did various things we've not done anything across the whole firm because it would be too complicated but there's lots of been uh, office level things and department level within that we've done we did the quizzes obviously but we've done would i lie to you today i was dressed up as a christmas present as part of our we do every year department heads dress up as something Christmas and we said we still do it and take photos and I'll just have to wear a costume all day. I think it should be inherent in if you're a leader of people that you shouldn't have to have organised events. You should know that you need to engage, you need to speak to people, you should just be able to pick up the phone and give them a call. And if you're not doing that, then maybe you shouldn't be a leader of people anyway. (laughs) And I think generally people have got that. I think we said 
when we were chatting before that meetings you t- tend to spend the first five ten minutes chatting exactly like you would if you walked into a room or you went into the kitchen in the office and and we're just having to accept that that makes meetings a little bit longer but it's worth it because that's that just remembering that people are there but you shouldn't have to be taught that that should really come as part of being a leader and I think you know across the eight nine months now but but you can see people's styles are changing so at first it was all of it odd being on all these meetings all the time and people weren't quite sure when to speak should they speak and whereas now people have got used to these there's that ease of actually if it's not quite right it doesn't matter it doesn't all have to be perfect just because you're all on video it's mm. okay sometimes to have your screen on with your home backdrop off if the, if the kid's coming into the room actually it's not the end of the world if people are a bit more at ease with actually this way of working and so mm. I think getting through this if we can all come out of this healthy we'll all be much stronger and have an entirely new skill set that then we can use to build different things with so it's a terrible thing that's happened but hopefully we can take some good things out of it as well and I think you just build some of this around your day I tend to ring someone who works in my team first thing in the morning when I'm walking the dog because you're walking the dog I might as well combine that with having a quick catch up with him and that works with him time it works with me and we don't have to do it all on video and I've been very open to people saying I'm doing this and I'm taking that and just adjusting their day everyone knows what role they've got to fulfill how they choose to do it now I think has shifted and I think we've all shifted with that it's it doesn't matter it's less about nine till five sat at your laptop it's now outcome based I think slightly more now, you know what role you need to fulfill and what your workload is. So do it around, I think you said, Bruno, a school run, remote learning, all of that, the doorbell going four times a day with all the parcels. Okay, and you, you lead a sizable team there, and it, the IT culture tends to be very go-go, especially the salespeople, doesn't it? Have you had to have a bit of an adjustment in how you're talking to people and so on? To start with, we were doing internally our Beer Friday just to get everyone on at the end of the week. And that was early on. I think after the first few weeks was fine. Then it was like some people would rather not kind of just sit on a call and talk about football or whatever the people who came on to do it. But from the customer perspective, the legal in lockdown that we've been doing with many of our firms, a little bit of wine in there just to entertain things and some mince pies and sherry for our Christmas one. But and feedback from that has been really, really positive, both from talking about these kind of challenges, but just having a bit bit of a laugh as well. So that's been great for us and feedback from our clients has made it all worthwhile. So that, that's actually been quite enjoyable for us, hopefully for our customers. And I think in a way people have got to know each other better. So it's taken down some of those maybe barriers that sometimes exist in, in the office because you know everyone's wearing their suit and everyone's being a certain way. I, I think this has really almost shown everyone a bit uncut and actually people have got to know each other better which can only be a good thing in in the longer term which is a great thing I think. Certainly at at the beginning there was never a video call with our managing partner where his dog didn't appear it actually is great but one of the other things I was going to add as well was I think a lot of it is testament to the very close-knit community that legal IT is as well so we've always been very supportive of each other we've Mm. always had quite an unusual so anyone that comes into legal IT is always really surprised by how supportive and collaborative we are because a lot of us are competitors but actually we don't let that get in the way of helping each other obviously there are certain pieces of information that we don't share with each other but actually broadly we are a very close-knit community and I've seen people pull together I've seen people ask for help from a community and actually it comes back almost overwhelmingly so any problem that you've got there's a community of people that you can ask for help and I don't think that exists in very many other industries. Yeah that's good but I did want to talk about some of the slightly techy aspects of what's gone on and what happens in 2021. One interesting thing for me is network architectures, IT infrastructure, they're going to have to be rather different aren't they for a, a different way of working when a lot of the communications are inbound and people are working on the road remotely from from homes and so on. What are you thinking about in terms of your technology stack for 2021? Are you thinking about accommodating these necessary changes at this point? Karen, please. Yeah, I think, I mean, the whole Wi-Fi bit, and I know it's a basic bit, but if you can't get that right, then nothing else will follow, will it? So both in the office and at people's homes, we've been you know much more wired in the office but we've now accepted particularly if we do move to a more agile way of working then you may not 
always be using the same desk and the way you want to use meeting rooms and breakout rooms and so on. So we're just going to have to move to completely wireless there. But also uh, people's homes. It's uncovered where people probably always struggled with their home connectivity. It was fine. They've got on with it through this never ending lockdown pandemic, more remote working. But if we want to offer more of an agile way of working, we've got to make sure that people are supportive. And even though we can't go to 3000 people's homes and fix their broadband for them, we can at least try and offer some sort of further assistance to that or rethink how we deliver it. And I guess the whole cloud piece The more you've got in the cloud, it's more somebody else's problem rather than you worrying about your VPN and your Citrix and this, that and everything else. So I think that probably will bring forward some of the things we've been thinking about a little sooner. The less you've got on premise, then the easier it gets when you want this more agile mobile workforce, I think. So, yeah, we'll definitely be looking at this next year. Bruna? Yes, the same actually. I mean, it's, we're on a call with Mobility yesterday, funnily enough, looking at actually what we can do for, for some of our people that are having challenges working from home because of poor Wi-Fi. And we're speaking to some other vendors in, in this area as well. So that's one of the key things. Looking at actually how we can keep all the kit up to date, security patches, software patches, get all that kind of delivered in time and in a timely fashion without someone's laptop stops working at home. So there's all that. How do you manage all this stuff, which was kind of easier when everybody was in the office because you had a guaranteed connectivity. So I think that's going to be the, the number one. Number two, I think it's actually how do we continue supporting people with their kit? And when they're coming back into the office, have we got enough space to, you know, we have a space called Ask IT at the moment. We need to make that bigger. So there's a more of a dropping sensor for when people are coming back to the office. So, so lots of different things, I think, plus all the stuff that we were already doing. And I think lots of thinking around how we're delivering training now and from new starter training to ongoing training and moving more to more video clips. All, I mean, it's all video now. We've made a huge shift. We were going to video anyway, but now it's just all video and there is no classroom training from a technology point of view, which has been a great thing. And what do we do next? You know, what comes after that? And, and how do we have that collaborative experience when it comes to training as well? Because the other side of training was that you would meet people going to that training room and, and have that connectivity. So what does that start to look like? So lots of different areas for us to think of around tech that we might not have thought of before. Yeah, Nabby? Well, everything that Karen and Bruna have said, I would concur. I think onboarding, we've made a special effort to make sure that people are feeling like they're part of the organisation because I think starting a a job in a new organisation in lockdown must be the most terrifying experience. Mm. Starting a new job is stressful enough as it is without having the added disadvantage Mm. of not being able to meet people in person and create the relationships that you need to be able to get your job done. So in terms of uh, of technology, yes, the same kinds of things that have been already said. I mean, we've had some interesting Wi-Fi challenges with people as well and have had to put various things in place to accommodate that. But I think one of the other challenges will be how, and I'm sure this is probably similar for lots of us, how we will reconstruct our service desks to provide the support that is now required. So we had a first line team and a second line team. The second line team is a warm pair of hands that goes to someone's desk to fix it if you, if it can't be fixed over the phone. Obviously, we have targets for first time fix remotely, but not everything works like that. People have become much more self-sufficient uh, fixing their own problems. I've got all of the second line guys answering the phone, so effectively become a first line support, but that's not necessarily sustainable going forward. So as the next few months unfold, it's working out how to size and shape your service delivery function to support an organization which is itself changing and fluid and not quite settled yet. So I think that's going to be a challenge, particularly for people who've got international global organizations. That's going to be quite interesting, I think. And it's something that up until the pandemic, you know, we all knew how to run a service desk. We all knew how to run a service delivery function because we've been doing it the same way for decades. And ITIL says you do it like this and it's all fine. And actually, we're all focusing on very different things that are adding value to the business and creating value. And now we've got to go back and reassess all those kind of fundamental things that we thought we didn't have to look at because mm. they were fine. So I think, as Bruna says, that you layer that on top of the stuff that we were doing anyway. I think that will be quite a challenge. Yes, so Shane, a panel here talking about the challenges with remote support. I guess also there's going to be issues about buying airtime as people increasingly use cellular services. Are you sort of building those plans into your 2021 as well? Yes, there's a a few things that have come out that all of the delegates have talked about today, which 
why we've seen a big increase in planned wireless projects for the new year, corporate wireless projects. So as people start to look at on mass, whatever on mass means in 2021, but coming back to the office. So that definitely echo those thoughts from what was said. Mobile contracts is interesting because the only people really that have been using cellular that much are people who've been probably tethering their phones to overcome poor home connectivity, maybe, because obviously people have not been traveling that much. But how how you plan your mobile contracts, especially if you're coming to the end of a contract over the last nine months or in the next 12 months, what do you sign up to? What amount of data are you going to use? What does that plan need to look like? So proactive management of those mobile carriers is we've seen a marked uptake in people wanting proactive management of carrier services and contracts and then the home support is a massive discussion point at the moment going from a centralized IT team and even like a device refresh where you have employees coming into the office to do refreshes clearly everyone's remote now and most firms aren't set up to support hundreds if not thousands of remote offices in which they've now become so We're looking at evolving our services because we do have engineering teams on the road. So how can we evolve our product offerings to offer things like office in a box? So rather than just installing home connectivity, maybe we can actually deliver the peripherals and the laptop and all that kind of good stuff as well. So we're we're looking to evolve our existing capabilities to match up with the demands of 2021 and, and beyond. So it will be an interesting year for sure. Yeah, and, and that's unfortunately about all we've got time for on this latest Mobilicity podcast. Thanks so much to all of my guests. It's been a really great discussion, and we look forward to welcoming you back next time for another Mobilicity podcast. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.